Good morning. My name is Ken Goldberg. I'm a professor of engineering and art practice here at Cal, and it is a great pleasure to welcome you all here today and to, as we inaugurate a new chancellor and a new chapter in the history of Cal. Chancellor Dirks and Janaki, welcome to Berkeley. A, very, a, very, a few housekeeping remarks. We ask that you mute your cell phones and other devices. We also ask that you refrain from taking photos and video because we are recording this event and it will be published on our website in a couple of weeks to extend this discussion around these important topics. And also, I hope that you're able to pick up these white question cards that we're, we're inviting you to ask questions, pose questions on these cards. And if you need one or more at any time, just hold up your hand and someone will come around. Beverly's in the back. Um, we'll come around for them. And you can also hold up your hand for us to pick one up for you. So as I was preparing for this event today, I thought back to my freshman year at the University of Pennsylvania. I had wanted to be an artist or an architect, but my family was struggling financially. And my mother advised me, study something practical so that you can get a job and then you can be an artist. So I enrolled in a dual major of engineering and business. That didn't leave much time for, art, for electives in the arts, but I quickly made friends in the humanities who were majoring in English and philosophy, and they told me about an amazing sociology professor named Philip Reif. Now each semester, Professor Reif would select one book or essay, and he would do a very careful admission process with, with personal in, in his office at interviews to select 10 undergraduates for this seminar where we would do a close reading of this text. I remember he was amused that an engineering major would apply. And luckily for me, he admitted me. And the semester that we, the, semest the, the text for that semester was The Penal Colony by Franz Kafka. Now Professor Reif <coughs> insisted that we dress properly for this symposium, that we not chew gum. We were not, in, we were not allowed to bring a paper or pencil. We were there to study and speak, uh, to focus intensely. And we met for three hours a week around the table where we analyzed each word and phrase in detail. By the end of the 15-week semester, we had not finished the entire essay. In fact, <clears throat> we didn't finish the first page. <laughs> In our seminar, we spent the entire semester focusing on the first paragraph. Now, I learned many things in my courses in computer science and economics, but what I learned from Professor Reif changed my life. He taught me how to read and reread, how to focus intensely and to question every word, to challenge what was printed on the page so that we could discover truths beyond what the authors had intended. Professor Reif was trained at the University of Chicago. And like many intellectuals and, and scholars who were pushing the boundaries of accepted wisdom, he joined the faculty here at Berkeley in the early 1960s. Now, why was Berkeley such a magnet? Because Berkeley was a place where, the, at the root of the culture here, was the idea of challenging, rigorously challenging, conventional wisdoms. As C.P. Snow noted, breakthroughs happen at the clashing point between cultures. And it's no secret that Berkeley has a long history of clashes and breakthroughs. So Chancellor Dirks, as a historian and a cult cultural anthropologist, chose to mark his arrival at UC Berkeley by launching an intellectual discussion about, the, about these cultures, about the culture of the university and the future of the university, not only this particular public research university, but the very concept of a university and its role in the 21st century. Today, we'll consider the tensions between the cultures of East and West both nationally and globally, between the cultures of the humanities and the sciences, technology, and between the cultures of private 
and public. To gather a range of perspectives, Chancellor Dirks invited 15 distinguished and accomplished scholars, three university, university presidents, a Nobel Prize winner, five of, of these colleagues are from other universities, and 10 from here at Cal. These speakers will consider the state of the university and engage us in a dialogue on three critical issues, undergraduate education, the global university, and, and basic and applied research. So as we begin, let's recall that 49 years ago, about 200 yards away from us, a group of Berkeley students questioned authority and changed the world. What they fought for was free speech. And their protest reminded students around the world that it was possible to stand up to authority, to leaders and governments. And I'm proud to say that the Berkeley faculty at the time recognized that free speech was a fundamental and core value for citizens around the world. But it was also very closely linked to another concept that was extremely, it's extremely important for faculties. That freedom is the freedom of inquiry. This is a primary justification for the concept of tenure, and it's a central defining characteristic of all universities. So as we proceed today, I ask you to keep in mind that freedom, that duty, to ask hard questions. So please formulate your own incisive questions for the panelists and write them on these cards that will be handed out so that, you can organize, so that we can organize them and present them to the speakers in the sessions. So to begin our dialogue, and to open our first session on undergraduate education, please join me in welcoming a beloved member of the Cal faculty, winner of a Pulitzer Prize and Poet Laureate of the United States, Robert Haas. Thank you, Ken. Chancellor Dirks, it's an honor and pleasure to be here today. Um, I've been teaching Berkeley undergraduates for 25 years. I have to say that it's been one of the gifts of my life. The talent and intensity and idealism, the variousness and obstreperousness um, and eagerness have made my days, my working days, vivid and, and my life way more interesting than it, I can imagine it having been otherwise. Um, and so I'm thrilled by the idea that we're going to open a new conversation on undergraduate education uh, at this time. And it made me reflect on the fact that I have thought very little about it in a broad way. And uh, myself, being too busy doing it in a day-to-day uh, -day way. And so since we were inaugurating a historian, I thought I should teach myself the history, which begins uh, of what we do with undergraduates and why, which begins actually with the moment Ken spoke about immediately upon the inauguration of President Martin Meyerson, Chancellor Martin Meyerson, in 1965. He appointed a faculty committee to study um, undergraduate education at Berkeley and come up with a report. And after teaching here for 25 years, I finally read it this week. Meyerson's Marching orders were to the faculty committee uh, were to find ways in which the traditions of humane learning and scientific inquiry can be best advanced under the challenging conditions of size and scale that confront a public university. Not bad, huh, as a language. And the head of that committee and the author of Education at Berkeley, the 1966 document, which is still in print from University of California Press, was Charles Muscatine, most eminent Chaucer scholar in the world. And he began by remarking that uh, his beginning supposition was going to be that uh, undergraduate education at Cal was not a mechanized training ground, we would now say digitized training ground for the upper reaches of the labor market. And. Uh, and proceeded to say, the report proceeded to say, just a few quotations from it, 
um, to say that um, we need to give more attention to the individual student as a person and offer her an education more sensitively adapted to her preparation and progress through the curriculum. Did you? No, it was 1966. He said, offer him an education more sensitively adapted to his preparation <laughs> for the curriculum. For many students, both undergraduate and graduate, there's not, it's evident, been adequate connection between their education and what they feel to lie to be their primary concerns as human beings and as citizens. And went on to say that though teaching large numbers of students at a public university was clearly a challenge that it also had in it enormous strengths and that we had to begin with those strengths and with the supposition that we can not just produce an adequate but a great undergraduate education under the particular conditions in which we work. And then there's an incredibly charming thing that gets said, which is that uh, this seems entirely possible, a challenge entirely possible to meet and I'm quoting now here, with judicious use of the support that we can reasonably expect from the state of California. <laughs> um, at the beginning of the actual report on content, the committee says our student body is too large, too various, and too changing to be susceptible to many forms of universal, many universal formulations. But if size and scale are problems, they are our assets and they are formidable assets, he says. That the close interpenetration of teaching and research should not only give a special character to the campus, it should give ultimate unity and coherence to a pluralist curriculum and a clear definition of its teaching role to the faculty. Um, that the approach to courses needs to be problem oriented rather than broad paying no attention to anybody in particular surveys. That education at Berkeley can be uh, based on an ideal of, let me come to it, our ideal is, our, is that our student be prepared and provided with rich opportunities, generous guidance, plenty of room for experiment, mentoring taken seriously, and that she or he be enabled to make for him or herself, you can imagine what I'm revising here, as many of the educational decisions themselves as possible. And then lays out the breadth requirements. It sounds to me great and still vital, and it seems to have organized many things. Apparently, this report was seriously resisted by the administration when it came out, and slowly over time, it's become what we do. Uh, the parts of it that are in place, I wanted to remind you of. One of the things that came out of immediately, thing originally called Cal Students for a Democratic Education, were student-initiated courses. Today, fall, 100, fall 2013, there are 187 student-oriented faculty supervised courses. Uh, Based on the idea that a research university should engage undergraduates in research, there are 53 separate programs uh, for undergraduate education and um, a thousand students a semester for the past two years have been engaged in the university research apprenticeship program, 2,000 a year of our undergraduates. 90 students every summer get full summer grants to do research work, and 20 of them get the Haas Scholars Program. We give away $50,000 in cash money every year to undergraduates for artistic and scholarly work and research. And the newest of these engagements is the Chernin uh, Program to encourage mentoring all the way along the line, undergraduates being mentored by graduate students, being mentored by young faculty. That program over its seven semesters in the English department has um, had um, 1,750 students, undergraduate students, involved in this mentoring program 
Partly, this is the visionary work of an alumnus, David Chernin, who wanted his money given to exactly this, this purpose. And its opening is be, be connected to 10 more departments starting this fall. A lot of ways we're doing that work. And this conversation is going to give us a thrilling chance to um, see how well we're doing it and to assess it and, and intensify it. Uh, the Muscatine report ended with, uh, by saying that we need to find greater, greater pluralism, more individual attention, and to cultivate a kind of teaching suffused with the excitement and the authority of original research. Really very exciting to read. And, and, uh, and a, um, uh, a place for this new conversation to begin, I thought. And it begins right now with our distinguished panelists, speaking of beloved professors, Saul Perlmutter, astrophysicist, Nobel laureate, uh, um, at my, uh, at my, uh, I know my right from my left, at my left, Michael Roth, cultural historian and president of Wesleyan University. Um, Hannah Gray, historian of political thought, former president of the University of Chicago. Uh, as the respondent will be our own professor of graduate education and African American studies, Naila Nasir. So uh, I will begin now by turning the podium to Michael, I think, or Saul, do you start? Okay, I'll start. <laughs> what a pleasure to be here in anarchistic Berkeley, where we make up things on the spot. I think your new chancellor um, had a, an education in this regard at, uh, at a young age uh, as, a, as an undergraduate at Wesleyan University. And we are uh, very proud uh, of his accomplishments. And uh, Wesleyan wishes you well. Uh, and for me personally, it's great to be uh, back in the uh, in Berkeley area. I lived here for, for some time and, and uh, have great affection for this uh, extraordinary university. So it's, it's uh, an honor to be part of these festivities and these conversations today. I, I'm going to be brief uh, as per my instructions and, and uh, talk a little bit about undergraduate education uh, with an eye to some of the public discourse uh, about uh, undergraduate education that, that gives one the feeling, especially if you're a professor in the humanities or in the interpretive social sciences, uh, that there's a real crisis afoot and that uh, undergraduate education, to quote the people who are selling business books, um, is going to be radically disrupted or uh, disintermediated. Um, these are buzzwords um, that um, serve uh, people who are teaching traditional business courses still very well in, in, their, uh, in, their, in, their, um, in their marketing uh, efforts. Uh, whether there is such a crisis in uh, undergraduate education or in liberal education uh, to me is very unclear. Uh, for the last couple of years I've been writing a little book called Beyond the University, Why Liberal Education Matters, and it's, 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 it's it has become clear to me that discussions of crisis about undergraduate education and especially about liberal education in the United States uh, go back to the founding of this country. And uh, almost every generation uh, experiences uh, what uh, this generation thinks is a new problem, which is the, 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 the tension between uh, the practical and the liberal, the tension between the vocational and the broad contextual education. Uh, and, you could see this uh, when Thomas Jefferson is arguing against uh, Harvard's method of tracking people into disciplines as soon as they sign up for school based on what the fathers of their sons thought they should do. Jefferson wanted to go in a completely different direction. Uh, and you can see it in, uh, in Franklin, Brent Franklin's complaints about um, a feat education that only taught people how to exit a drawing room properly um, and, 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 and taught them nothing useful at all, Franklin said. But Franklin, of course, was not just interested in narrow instrumental education. He was interested in an education that would convey a spirit of experimentation. That's true whether you're in the sciences or the social sciences or the humanities or the arts. A spirit of education excuse me, a spirit of experimentation that you get through education, a spirit of experimentation. And I do think the critiques of higher education that we hear 
and it's probably no accident, most of it coming from Silicon Valley and Stanford, uh, those, critiques, those critiques are really about trying to make education more a production of conformity than a spirit of experimentation. And that has been true for 200 years in the United States. Uh, the defenders of liberal education have been those who see education as a way, as a, as a way of uh, resisting conformity. Uh, and those, especially today, who would substitute um, uh, manic monetization for broad contextual learning, they see education as a way of in insisting on conformity as a, as a, as a, as a technique for making me America more competitive. Uh, they are politically retrograde, and they are economically um, actually imp impoverished in their thinking because conformity will not make the United States more competitive economically. So at the beginning of, of this story in the United States, or near the beginning of the story in the United States, I just want to mention uh, two terms, uh, autonomy and enthusiasm. Autonomy and enthusiasm, which I think still are essential uh, in, in undergraduate education. Whatever you're taking, whether it's astrophysics or uh, philosophy in the movies or uh, the history of political theory, whatever you're taking um, from the Jeffersonian perspective at the er, uh, early uh, 1900s, uh, uh, sorry, the early 19th century, uh, from that Jeffersonian perspective, whatever you're taking should make you more uh, autonomous, more capable of making your own decisions, more capable of resisting tyranny, actually, more capable of resisting the powers of authority. And so undergraduate education should be the place where you become the person capable of giving yourself your own rules, making your own decisions, becoming uh, autonomous. Uh, uh, the, the other term I, I take from the uh, uh, early days of American education comes from Emerson, and, and, and it's very different from Jefferson. Jefferson's view, Jefferson's view, inconsistently applied, of course, hypocritically applied, of course. Jefferson's view was that Education in college, education in university, should make you more capable of choice and of resisting tyranny. Emerson said, that's not enough. Education should enhance your capacity for enthusiasm, for being passionate about the world around you, for enlivening the world around you. You know, Emerson said, what the task of a college is is not to drill into you skills that you can then market to someone else. The task of a college is to set your soul aflame to study whether it's the penal colony or whether it's scientific experimentation, to, to give you a sense of invigoration that you then translate into making the world a, a more alive around you. So autonomy and enthusiasm, two terms from the early um, 19th century that were applied to liberal education in the United States. Um, from the end of that century, I want to mention two other terms which I think remain uh, important uh, uh, for us. And the, the first is uh, cooperation, and the second uh, is empowerment. Uh, because neither Jefferson nor Emerson really thought too much about how education developed skills or capacities for cooperation. And Jane Addams did think about that um, at the, uh, as the 19th century began, became the 20th century. Jane, Jane Addams was very interested in how a certain kind of education makes you very good at being critical of things, right? Makes you very good at seeing through hypocrisy or seeing through lies uh, or just turning your nose up at, at popular culture. A certain kind of education does that. But what that education reduces in a person is that person's ability uh, of, for empathy, that, that person's what she called sympathetic imagination. And what Adams wanted to see happen in educational venues was the cultivation of the sympathetic imagination as a complement to autonomy and enthusiasm so that people in their educational endeavors would not just learn to be standing on their own two feet or uh, isolated individuals, which Dewey would call a, a, particularly psych, a particular psychopathology, Adams said, Jane Adams said, what she wanted education to do was to make us see the world from someone else's point of view so that we are engaged in helping those people most vulnerable, uh, helping those people who are, are, are most likely to be suffering around us. Education then has a social purpose, has a social purpose um, that is not just about individual enthusiasm or empowerment, uh, sorry, individual enthusiasm or autonomy. 
The next word I want to talk about briefly is empowerment. Because around the same time that Jane Addams is doing her work in, in, the, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, um, Du Bois, W.E.B. Du Bois, is coming into his own as an educator. And he is eager to see that education is not going to be reduced to vocationalism. His big debate with Booker T. Washington was precisely about this. He knew that if education was reduced to instrumental learning, that that would result in conformity. And what Du Bois wanted, especially for uh, freed slaves and their descendants, what Du Bois wanted for Africans and African Americans was that education be linked to empowerment. That you understood through education, through cooperation, enthusiasm, and autonomy, that you understood that you could have more power to change the world. And in today's context, education as empowerment becomes education as giving our students the ability to resist conformity, the ability to incite change, the ability to create a culture of innovation and experimentation, not a culture of duplicity and conformity. Undergraduate education, I think it's very clear, can produce duplicity and conformity. Under the guise of learning, you learn how only to participate in power structures that you will not affirm as legitimate, but you will profit from. Or education, as it has done for so long at Berkeley, and I'd like to think at Wesleyan, education can produce a mode of thinking that gives students the ability to resist conformity as they draw on resources from the past to instigate change and innovation. Thank you. I began teaching 60 years ago, one of those years very happily at Berkeley. And as a consequence, I've passed through countless cycles of discussion and debate about undergraduate education, and particularly liberal education. And I agree with a great deal of what Michael has said today. And I've witnessed a number of swings, great swings, in the pendulum of thinking about these issues and a great swing in the kinds of conclusions, the kinds of outcomes to which those have led. So I've participated in major and recurrent debates about general education and its many forms of general education about elective curricula, and about that I would say ditto. I've lived through the wars over whether political and social priorities should direct the course of, of learning, the curriculum, and the aims of such a curriculum. I've lived through the wars over multicultural and gender studies, through the culture wars as well over the good or evil of courses in Western civilization and over the question of requirements in general. And now, of course, over the pressing claims of STEM and the needs of our society in relation to other fields of study, over international education and study abroad, over credit for such activities as internships and community service, and threaded, of course, through all of these kinds of discussions over and over again has been an endemic anxiety over the purposes, the value, and the survival of liberal education. Now, as a historian, I'm, of course, well aware that 60 years is nothing at all drop in the bucket of the seas of all this controversy, which have been raising over years, which began, after all, in antiquity. Unhappily, there are those who would question whether history has much to contribute to this problem at all. Think, for example, of the man known as the gloomy dean of St. Paul's, who observed that events in the past may be roughly divided into those which probably never happened and those which do not matter. <laughs> that, he said, is what makes the trade of the historian so attractive. But nonetheless, I take seriously Cicero's words that not to know about the past 
is to remain always a child. I believe it essential that we connect in a significant way to the larger past, that we gain a sense of history, that we gain a perspective on our own age, and that we come to know something of how our own familiar present has come into being. No, understand something about how its institutions, its culture have evolved, what its trajectory might be, what its dilemmas consist in. I like to think that studying history should have some effects beyond that central purpose of understanding something, of being able to think historically, imaginatively, of stretching one's own experience to include in some way that of others. But I like to think that studying history should also have some effects beyond that, that these can help a, sh a person's, help shape a person's mental habits in a number of different ways. That is, learning respect for evidence and the critical evaluation of evidence, acquiring at least some degree of comfort in accepting and dealing with complexity, understanding how change and tradition may intersect and interact, whether in conflict or in barely perceived transitions, seeing how seemingly disparate elements and conditions in a given situation and context can work on one another, increasing one's faculty of independent thought, refusing to accept what has been called cheap and simple interpretations of life and history. The aims that I've cited are, of course, those often generally assigned to general education or liberal education more broadly. And modern times have added to its domain many subjects and methods of learning in the sciences and social sciences to a canon of liberal arts initially founded in the humanities. And so the liberal arts have become the liberal arts and sciences. Now American higher education, as Michael has remarked, inherited at its outset the old humanist understanding of the liberal arts and later became attracted to scholarship the new kinds of scholarships that were present in German universities, to specialization, and to this greater disciplinary inclusiveness. And with that, the model of science and of research as the essential mode of discovery was joined to that of the humanities, and that conjunction made new claims on the undergraduate curriculum, ones that were often bitterly resisted and that still resonate today. The transformation of academia into college, as colleges were transformed into universities and new universities founded came to infuse and to drive a very much broadened definition of the liberal arts and of the curriculum per se. I think that in consequence, there was also always the question and never more so than in our own society as to the value of the liberal arts. Those spring from the strong view that they lack practical benefit. That's always existed in our, in our tradition. And that they fail to prepare the young for the so-called real world as though there were a world more real than that of the culture we have inherited that has lasted for so long. And that unlike the school of experience, also known as the school, of course, the famous school of hard knocks, it does not prepare people for life. And in our own world, I think we live with a curious contradiction now, there's, that there is on the one hand, a very considerable respect for higher education and for learning, and that that coexists with this deep suspicion as to its ultimate worth. And now we're at a moment haunted by recession and its consequences at a time of rising educational costs, diminishing public support, skepticism about outcomes, when the noise around these issues has reached a very shrill crescendo. One is reminded of the remark attributed to President Eisenhower that things have never been the way they are today in history. Very profound remark. <laughs> So that liberal education nowadays appears to be on the defensive. 
While the causes of its perceived decline are explained in a variety of ways, there appears to be a widespread view that the usual language of justification can no longer suffice, that one must prove the economic and social benefits it provides, that preparedness for life and jobs has been too readily subordinated to a kind of dilettantism, that investment in this kind of education has not paid and will not pay off. There are self-anointed prophets nowadays calling for something called disruption, really a dreadful phrase, and asking for revolutionary change in undergraduate education that will take us beyond a naive belief that an education in the liberal arts constitutes a good in itself. And these strictures, of course, have been, have been pointed especially at the humanities and the identification of the humanities as lying at the conceptual heart of a liberal arts education. All that has become a kind of negative in the outlook of critics who want to see specific and measurable educational re results. And humanists are trying to respond by uttering the bromides that you can find, for example, in reports like the one recently issued by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in order to reassure people that really there's, there's gold ahead if you were to study the humanities. There really is gold ahead. So in the end, I think there's no way in which all students are going to learn equally or learn all the same lessons and skills or learn at the same pace or at the same time. It seems to me, actually, that many people are actually returning to an ideal of study in the liberal arts that had less appeal to them, perhaps, when they were in college, when they were older perhaps wanting education to catch up with their experience and to help interpret their experience and to expand it and to enrich it. And I think we're going to see more of that in the times ahead. I think liberal education is going to become increasingly important as we live longer for people who have come through perhaps more than one career and who want to dwell, to reflect more on the meaning of the world around them and of their own lives. So historians have been called prophets of the past, and I venture no certain forecast. But there is surely no one future for liberal education, just as there is no one perfect curriculum. Its varying features are going to depend heavily on the outcomes of issues whose resolution we can only partially affect. Political and economic developments and pressures, the future development and potential of technology, access to higher education and support for higher education, both public and private, are clearly in the forefront. But the future will rest, as the past has done, on the ability of institutions to remain faithful to their educational missions, while adapting to the necessities and opportunities not always predictable that the continuing advance and reinterpretation of knowledge and its requirements will create. And without liberal education, that will not happen, in my opinion. Thank you. So originally, I uh, thought it was very good to be going uh, last in a panel like this after two very distinguished uh, thinkers on, on these areas. And of course, now that it comes to it, I realize that it's a big mistake uh, as, as you know, being a, you know, somebody who's a little bit a little differently <laughs> approaching these problems from a slightly different, uh, a, a, a different side. Um, but I realize that perhaps the one thing that I might be able to contribute to the conversation uh, would just be a specific example um, of, of just one experiment, one course um, that, we, that we've been working, that uh, a few of us have been working on, um, because I think it does actually raise a number of the same questions and it, and it ties in, I think, to many of the same issues again. Um, this course actually uh, it came about in this uh, new uh, big idea course concept that many of you have heard of at, at, at Berkeley, which is supposed to be interdisciplinary teaching, uh, you know, using faculty from different uh, fields, different areas. And uh, originally, we came interested in, the, in, this, in this idea uh, when I was asking about, when I was, when I was thinking about the practical question of uh, what is a reasonable expectation for distribution requirements at a university? And of course, there's a, it, it, 
it's really where, you know, in some sense, the rubber meets the road in a lot of these discussions. Uh, what is it that you really would want to ask undergraduates all to have taken and all to have uh, studied um, for them to be considered you know, educated men and women? And the uh, problem, of course, is that you immediately find yourself thinking, um, well, you know, how could an educated man or woman you know, call themselves educated if they don't know that they live in a universe that's expanding and ideally also know that it's accelerating? And then, of course, you turn to your, <laughs> you turn to your colleague uh, you know, down the hall, and, uh, and they say, yes, but you know, how can an educated man or woman not know, you know the next uh, item? And very quickly, you um, come up with an impossible job uh, to teach an educated man and woman. And so that you know, raised the, next, the obvious next question of, well, is this something that one could abstract out of what it is that we think of as so important about our own fields that actually could help you know, in, in, a, in a bigger picture? And, I, and the bigger picture that I was interested in um, is this question of, you know, we live in a world with many problems to solve. And I think that we have a very good shot at doing it if we learn how to solve problems collectively. And then the question is, what have I learned as a scientist in studying, let's say, the expansion of the universe um, that actually might be useful uh, when you ask, what do I want to, to know about if I'm going to approach new problems? So I sat down and I started collecting you know, all the things that I felt were really important. Many of them were taught purely by apprenticeship as you went through a um, graduate you know, program, um, postdoc work, uh, just drawn partly uh, by the lessons from your mentors, but also from the, um, you know, the environment around you, know, around you. And I, I thought that these were actually topics that you could teach, and that it actually would be helpful to have been taught some of these as an undergraduate um, you know, in advance, whether or not you were going to be a scientist um, in, in the way you would use them. So, just to be a little specific, you know, I'd say you know, some examples of this sort of uh, thing are one of the things I was taught early on was that we really approach problems uh, with the idea that as we try to understand what, what we're seeing, uh, we are going to fool ourselves and we're going to be making mistakes and that our job as scientists primarily is to spend you know, 97% of your time trying to figure out how you are wrong this time. You know, where, where is the mistake this time? And that there may be a tiny little bit left over for then trying to explain to other people why you believe some result that you have, but it's certainly the opposite of the, uh, of the standard question that you know, a reporter will often ask me is, what did you set out to prove when you start to do your work? And you know, I think a, a, a scientist is really trained in this idea that you're not proving anything. You're looking to see in what way now you can catch yourself from being wrong. And teaching a lot of tools in doing that. Some of the tools are the standard tools of statistics, uh, you know, recognizing the fact that random numbers will often look like patterns, and it'll turn out that, uh, you know, that it's just random. It's not that you've actually found the pattern in, in, in the world. Uh, some, some of the uh, tools are very, you know, are even modern, uh, sophisticated tools that have just been invented in the last few years. There's a, uh, a technique called blind analysis that the physicists are only now starting to adopt in certain areas where uh, unlike um, you know, double-blind experiments you know, in, uh, in medicine, uh, the, the idea of blind analysis is that you don't let yourself look at the results of an analysis until after you've done every possible cross-check of the steps of the analysis, um, including you know, debugging all of your programs, because otherwise um, you will only find the bugs and you will only find the mistakes um, if you get an answer that surprises you. Um, and if you get, uh, I'm sorry, yes, right. And so that, that means that um, you will never find the mistakes that lead you to an answer that you expected or that you wanted to see. And so it puts a bias into things. So we collected, uh, so I started collecting these kinds of tools. And then I found myself realizing that all this doesn't help much um, you know, as, a, as a single discipline um, when you realize that you put a bunch of well-trained physicists together into a, a faculty meeting, and the faculty meeting doesn't go any better than any other faculty meeting. Uh, you know, it's not suddenly much more rational um, because we all know these tools, and that clearly there are other things that one might want to teach as part of this uh, story. So that's why it became an interdisciplinary big idea course, um, and I found a social psychologist, uh, Rob McCoon, um, in the public policy school um, who could help teach uh, the, some of the materials uh, that have to do with you know, where does our thinking you know, fail, where, where do we go wrong, particularly in groups, when we start trying to make decisions and, and think through ideas together as a group, there are, there are practices that work better and there are practices that work more poorly, and that we, there are very standard ways of falling into error in groups that are different from the ways that we were taught as scientists not to fall into error as a scientist, you know, uh, examining a problem. 
So we started to build a course, and then of course we had to include the humanities side of the story. So we have uh, John Campbell uh, from the uh, philosophy department, um, because obviously these are questions that philosophers have you know, struggled with you know, for, for a very long time as well and, and have things to say about. And we ended up building up a course that was built around uh, trying to identify maybe, oh, 20 specific topics, like the two I, I described to you, and then coming up with ways for the students to experience all of these failures, all these ways that we can fall into error, and then experience better practice that might kept pull you out of the error and uh, in, in the future. And we were trying to do it in an experiential way so that someday when you came across a, a problem in life, you might suddenly find yourself saying, hey, wait a second, I'm doing that classic problem that you know, we did that, that day in, in class. Um, now, obviously, a, a, an attempt at this uh, is pure experimentation. And I think in the end, maybe a lot of its value is the fact that you're teaching a course where you can show the students that you're just trying something out and that yeah. you're experimenting and that you're, and you're teaching them that sense of enthusiasm that you were describing, that you're, uh, you're excited by the possibility that you can learn these things. And I think that that is almost as valuable as the actual content in the end uh, because it also uh, was teaching by doing. It was, it was showing you know, us asking, you know, is this course working? You know, um, in the end, you know, I, 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 we got wonderful uh, you know, student responses. Uh, you know, people said it was the most valuable course they, they, they you know, some of them said, most valuable course they ever took, you know, <laughs> et cetera. But um, you, you, you find yourself, you immediately think, well, that's what I want to believe. And, uh, and of course, you know, the, the immediate next question is, you know, how, how are we wrong this time? And, you know, and, and what about this course, you know, is not going to uh, do the job that we would like it to do? And so I, I, uh, I so I think that's enough about the, the, the course, but I just wanted to use it as an example um, of one of the ways that you might ask, you know, can we abstract from all the different domains that, uh, that you know, the, the university represents um, towards you know, what are some of the things that from each of these different areas of expertise can we bring to the table that we would like the next generation to go out into the world. Um, I, I was just at a, a Senate hearing uh, th th this week and watching you know, the, uh, the the non-interaction, the, the non-discussions that go on you know, in that context. And you find yourself uh, wondering, uh, you know, someday if you could have educated an entire student bodies you know, all over the whole country and they were the, the senators, would they find themselves looking at each other and saying, we can't discuss it this way. That's the classic such and such error. You know, it, it, <laughs> you know, we should, uh, so that, that would, of course, be you know, the, the dream goal, I think, of any educator to feel that um, someday we're able to approach problems in the world um, with you know, not just the uh, technical capabilities, but also the empath empathetic capabilities and the, and the abilities to work problems through together as groups um, that you know, the, the, all the different uh, disciplines teach us if, if abstracted out and, and taught well. So let me, let me stop there. Thank you for those um, enlightening comments. So we have lots of great questions from the audience. I wanted to start the question period by just reflecting for a brief moment on my own positionality in relation to undergraduate education at Berkeley. I'm a faculty member here, and not just a regular faculty member, I'm a resident faculty member, which means I live in the dorms with students. Um, I'm a chair, chair of the African American Studies Department. I am a scholar of education, so I study learning. I consider myself to be a learning scientist. Um, I'm alumni of this university, and I'm a former faculty member at an elite private university, and the parent of a current Cal student. She graduates in the spring. Um, yes. <laughs> so I come to this conversation from a lot of different angles, and as you were talking, um, I thought about the ways that the conversation we're having here this morning mirrors many other conversations in education circles um, that we're thinking both about this, the goal of education, and I love this setting your soul aflame with a social purpose, um, and, and raising questions about how to do this under many constraints and many kinds of constraints that we're operating under as, uh, as a large, diverse institution. And, also reflecting on how to do it in a way that doesn't just reproduce where we are as a society now, but that allows our students to envision something that we ourselves couldn't even imagine. Um, but I think that another big issue is attending to who we serve and who we have the potential to marginalize, right, as we structure educational experiences for our students. 
So I want to start with a question from the audience kind of along those lines. Um, the question is, Berkeley is an engine of social mobility for many low-income, first-generation college goers. Uh, many of our students and their parents care deeply about readiness for career paths. How do you convince them of the value of a liberal education? And, and I might add, should you convince them of the value of a liberal education? Anyone who wants to take the question. You're up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm up, apparently. <laughs> yes, you should. And uh, I, I think the, 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 uh, the, f the fact that uh, Cal is seen by many people as, as a uh, engine of social mobility is, is a really important thing in a society where there's less and less um, social and economic mobility um, and, and, and greater fear that if you're not in the super elite, your danger of being extremely vulnerable is, is um, enormous. And I, th I think that is quite different um, from um, the situation when I, when I was an undergraduate. Uh, I, I do think that it, it's important for us to be able uh, uh, to show how to translate what we're learning on campus into other kinds of thinking and decision-making and meaning-making activities. Uh, I, I do think that's uh, a, an important function of the university today, uh, as you were doing, actually, in talking about your class, uh, that these are modes of thinking, uh, ways of approaching problems and working in teams that are relevant to the problems you're looking at in that class but what your hope is, is that they're going to resonate when you're thinking about other problems. Uh, I do think it's important for universities to work hard to uh, give their students opportunity uh, upon graduation without thinking that working hard, uh, hard in that regard is tracking them into, spe into the specific career paths. So I, I think it's a, it's a nuanced responsibility for universities to enhance the student's ability to translate what she's learning in a history class or an astrophysics class or in a philosophy class uh, into ways of thinking that they can apply in a variety of endeavors. I think the time when we, especially at research universities, I, I, I suspect, the time when we could make believe that our undergraduates were actually trying to be professors is over. And I think it should be over. I think it's a really bad way of, try, of, of teaching is to make believe that your, most of your students are going to go to graduate school in your field. Um, it's never been true, but many of us actually taught as if that were the case because it seemed a heightened seriousness of purpose. I actually think it's laziness uh, um, because we who've gone to graduate school and became professors, that's what we know best. Uh, but what we can actually teach is, uh, are these subject areas in such a way that students can see how the study of political theory or the study of uh, social psychology resonates in w ways uh, that uh, are, are of interest to them as they pursue other endeavors after graduation. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to switch gears a tiny bit. Um, this is a provocative question from the audience. Um, the questioner writes, I'm curious about the, common, about the core curriculum from University of Chicago and Columbia. Could it be adopted at Cal? Why or why not? And again, I might add, should it be adopted at a place like Cal? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't have the wisdom to know what should be adopted at Berkeley. But I think that it is difficult to adopt in very large institutions, or more difficult to adopt in very large institutions, in part because it is an expensive and intensive form of learning and teaching, because it really does require, I think, the opportunity for discussion and constant discussion, and therefore does require, at its best, relatively small classes. There are different ways, on the other hand, of having a core curriculum, and Columbia's and Chicago's have been different. Columbia's, of course, is uh, the longest lasting so far of any core curriculum. Chicago was a little late in coming to it, even though we're not really the second city. But on the other hand, and even though we live in flyover country, Still, uh, it is a fact, I think, that there are ways of having distribution requirements that can, in some ways, be 
helpful in creating something like a uh, core curriculum, but until we begin to train graduate students again to have more breadth in their training, because their training has become narrower all the time. I mean, it used to be in a field like history, where in antiquity, when I was in graduate school, you had to take fields outside those of your specialization. And nowadays, you no longer have to do that. And therefore, just the very idea, even though many people who go to graduate school were inspired initially by some general course, there is a tendency not only to be more interested in teaching one's own thing, but a little bit apprehensive about what it takes to do a, a uh, course in a core curriculum. Columbia has been wonderfully successful, I think, in attracting the right kinds of uh, faculty for that. And I think we've been pretty fortunate too, but it's a struggle always. And finally, I think about a core curriculum. It has to be reinvented every decade or two because the faculty feel who teach it have to feel the possession of it. They can't start teaching something that has been designed by somebody else, like teaching somebody else's book. So all that has to happen, and I think the larger the institution, probably the more difficult it is to make it work. Yeah, it could, could take us a decade to get such a thing through our various bureaucratic structures. Um, <laughs> first of all, if, um, if we can't make every student equal part scientist, artist, entrepreneur, can you name three things every, students, every student should leave Berkeley with that would qualify as educated? that would help them qualify as well. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Hmm. All right, that's one of some possible questions. But, uh, but, but, but I, I would say that uh, you know, watching the, the, the uh, students in this particular course, I, you know, I was feeling that Berkeley is very well positioned in terms of teaching these, these kinds of skills um, that we have students that are just an amazing student body. They, you know, they, uh, and, and it's great to be able to talk about this at an inauguration event just because uh, we, can't, we do have the, the ability with this group of students to do things that I think are a little bit you know, difficult in terms of slightly abstracted questions where you, uh, where you ask them, you know, how did we solve this problem? And, uh, and how could we solve them you know, again in the future? And you maybe even ask them to uh, be, you know, be thinking about you know, what, to be familiar with what are the ways that people have approached uh, you know, these, these various different problems of, over the years uh, and what new ideas are, uh, are floating around. So I think you know, that category of, 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 uh, of understanding, I think, is certainly one of the ones I would love people to have. Obviously, you would still like them to have a, a reasonable body of, of, of knowledge, you know, some depth in, in some area. That's, you know, that's uh, I think, still something that's a, a uh, you know, obvious goal of, uh, of you know, most majors and, and most universities. And I think it's an appropriate one. But I, I, I think maybe those are the, the two that I'll, I'll, I'll leave with at the moment. Well, with that, we're going to bring this panel to a close. I want to thank you all for this exciting conversation, and hopefully it's the beginning of many conversations on this topic.